Now this last part of chapter 7 here in 1 Corinthians is devoted to the subject of uh, courtship or dating. And I like the, the idea of courtship much better than dating because I believe that that's a more biblical concept. And so it's, as we read this particular text, you're going you're gonna to realize that um, courtship, dating is a difficult subject no matter what period of time you lived in. And so the Corinthians had a whole lot of questions about this particular subject. And so, as many do today. And so Paul has some very specific counsel here. Now, can you apply his counsel to today? I believe you can. I believe that there are some very important principles here that can be applied uh, in our daily life. Now, notice here in verse 25, he says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Now where does Paul get his convictions, his counsel that he is about to give here? Are these just all of his own ideas? Is this uninspired uh, instruction that's not inspired by the Holy Spirit? I don't believe so. I believe that it is definitely inspired by the Spirit. But this is a this phrase here, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment. Now, many times when people read this, they think to themselves, well, Paul's just saying, this isn't really from the Lord, this is just from me. Now, that is a, an understanding that is incorrect. Basically, we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3.16, it says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all the scripture is inspired by God. What Paul is saying here is he has no direct commandment concerning this issue of how should someone be treated prior to actual marriage. He's saying here that these there's no direct commandments from the Lord on this topic, but that he is basing his advice here on what he believes is God's instruction, God's wisdom, and obviously inspired by the Spirit. He said that he is one that has obtained mercy to be faithful to the Lord. So his, adv his advice is based on the Spirit's instruction, the wisdom that God has given to him and that he has learned in his own life. And that is inspired by the Holy Spirit here in this text. Now that last little phrase there, as one who the Lord in His mercy has made trustworthy. That word trustworthy is actually a Greek word for faithful. And so He has made Him faithful by His mercy. In fact, that's the only way you can ever be faithful to the Lord to his word, to others, is by mercy. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.1, Paul said, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And so what was it that kept Paul from losing heart in his, in his ministry? He said it's mercy. And so the mercy of God is what enables you to serve, to keep serving, to be faithful. And it is His work, the work of the Spirit inside of you that is enabling that to take place. And so when we, when we look in the past, we look at our lives and we look at the faithfulness, we need to say, thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His grace that has enabled me to serve him and to stay in this position. Now, it is important, I think, also to note at the end of verse 40, notice what he says there. After he says, gives all this counsel, he said, 
but she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. So notice, he believes that he is inspired by the Spirit here. He believes that he has wisdom that God has given to him. He believes that he has the mercy of God, that he has learned these truths in his own life. And so he's going to give us here some really great counsel that is, is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So what are the issues that he believes were important to consider before you marry? Where you need to be faithful? So this is an important issue. I believe that there are, well, at least eight really good principles here in this text that I want you to look at. The first is in verse 26 through 28. He says, I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So what is the first piece of counsel that Paul gives to the Corinthian church here? He says he addresses here the issue in verse 26 of the present distress or the present trouble or the present calamity. That's what the uh, Greek word there for distress means. So there was a present situation, a calamity, a difficulty that was going on in the Corinthian church at this time. And most commentators, most historians believe that this was the beginning of the persecution that was coming up on the church. Not only did the Corinthians have difficulty with their own moral lifestyle, but also they were struggling with persecution and conflicts galore within the church. And so he is saying to them, the present distress is the central reason why he is giving this this instruction here to virgins, to widows, and to those who are divorced. Now you have to take this, remember, in the context of this entire passage. And, and he is addressing, if you go back into the beginning of chapter 7, he is addressing the issue of married people, he's addressing the issue of single people, he's addressing the issue of people who have been divorced. So he's talking about all of these issues. And this is the reason why he gives this counsel. So why, wisdom requires you to consider present circumstances. So present distress would be that present circumstance that they were in the midst of at that time. And so I always encourage people, look, when you're considering marriage, you need to consider all of the circumstances that are surrounding this relationship because that is going to give you some, some wisdom to help you make a good decision in your life. Now, he is encouraging them here because of the present distress. If they're married, don't, get, don't separate from your spouse. The problem, the, the struggle that people have is the part where he says, don't seek a wife. You see, don't get married because of this present distress that is upon you at this time. Now, is that wise counsel? Well, think back during the Second World War. There were a multitude of people who did not get married simply because there was a world war going on. And that is clear from, from history. In the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, there the Lord tells Jeremiah not to get married as well. Notice. 
The word of the Lord also came to me, saying, You shall not take a wife, nor shall you have sons or daughters in this place. For thus says the Lord concerning the sons and daughters who are born in this place, and concerning their mothers who bore them and their fathers who begot them in this land, they shall die gruesome deaths. They shall not be lamented, nor shall they be buried. But they shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. They shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, and their corpses shall be meat for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth. Now, that's the counsel that God gave to Jeremiah. Now, why did he give him that? Because of the distress, that was, the calamity, the tragedies that were about to take place in that land because of the Babylonian destruction and the Babylonian uh, invasion that was, a, was about to take place. And so the application for you, if you are someone who is married, you should not get unmarried. If you're somebody that's single, then you should consider all the circumstances very closely before you make that decision. Now, is it wrong to marry? Notice he goes right on to say here, verse 28, but if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. And so there, he, she, he's saying, look, hey, you, can, you still can make your own decision, but this is my counsel to you. This is what I'm encouraging you to do. Now, I have done the very same thing many times with people who are considering marrying one another because I see some circumstances that I don't think are really advantageous for them getting married at that particular time in their life. And so I warn them and I say, look, I don't think I'd do this if I were you. And then I usually end with, but it's your decision. It's your choice. It's not some commandment from me. It's not some commandment from the Lord. This is just my counsel. You can take it or leave it. And so that basically is what Paul is telling them to do here. Now, what are some of the circumstances that I would tell someone not to consider marrying another person at that particular time? Oh, there's a multitude of them. If an individual doesn't have a job, and cannot provide for their home. I would say that's not a real good time to get married. Or if an individual is a brand new Christian, I mean, they just got saved. Well, I'd say give that person a little time to grow and mature and get established. Or they've just been widowed. They've just been divorced. Again, not a real good idea to jump right back into marriage with someone else. Now, how many times have you met someone who has been caught on the rebound, so to speak, and they have gone off and gotten married very quickly after their spouse has died, after their spouse has left them and divorced them? I'm telling you, it's not many times a very good situation. Sometimes you make bad decisions. Not necessarily always is the case, though. So... You have to give that counsel, that warning, and encourage people to consider all of the circumstances. I usually tell people to consider the character qualities of the person they are about to marry. If you see some loose morals, if you see some character qualities that bring a red flag to your mind, then I don't think that that's probably a good moment to, to marry them. It'd be better to take a little closer look and examine a little closer uh, what is going on in that, that relationship and in that person's life. I want you to note, though, the freedom that he gives these people here. He said, if you choose not to take my advice, you, you have not sinned. You're not disobeying the great apostle. You're just 
You're making your own decision. This is your choice. And so remember that because I believe that you, you hear that and he re- repeats the same counsel in the same way uh, throughout this passage. Now there is no sin for remarriage after being loosed from a wife or for a first-time marriage. That is pretty clear here in this text as well. Notice he says here, are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But even if you do marry, now who is he referring to there? Even if you do marry, he's referring to those in the, very, in the, very, uh, in the previous verse that he refers to, are you loosed from a wife? Have you been divorced by your wife? So if you do marry, which means a divorced p- person can remarry if they have, have the biblical grounds and they have been divorced by someone who has gone off with someone else and committed adultery or their spouse has died. Notice at the end of this text, verse 39, a wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. And so, very clearly here, he gives this complete freedom to those that have been uh, divorced by their partner for unbiblical reasons, or if the person has committed adultery, obviously they have the right to be remarried. And so they have not sinned. And the reason why we know that, because he says then, and if a virgin marries. So he clearly makes a distinction between those that have been loosed from a wife and those that have, been, have never been married. So a uh, very important uh, clarity there in that particular text. Now the second issue that Paul addresses here in his counsel is to honestly consider the struggles that you will experience in marriage. Verses 28 through 32. So he says, If you do marry, you have not sinned. If a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, here it is, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. So that, this is the reason why he gives this counsel. He says, I want to spare you from this trouble in the flesh. And then he goes on to say, but I say this, brethren, the time is short so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. So they should be, those that are married should be living with the same priorities they did before they got married. He says those who weep as though they did not weep, most likely referring to the weeping at the loss of a spouse. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world not as misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. And so he he tells them here that the trouble in the flesh that they are going to experience obviously is going to be because of the present distress that is taking place there, the persecution and the the struggle that they are going to go through because they are married. Now, every marriage has trouble in the flesh. Why? Because they're two sinners married. That's why. And when you have two sinners that are yoked together, I don't care how spiritual they are, they're going to have trouble because they're going to have their flesh is going to get in the way. They're going to, I mean, one morning you are going to wake up with a bad attitude. So, I don't care how nice you are, you're going to wake up with a bad attitude. And you're going to wake up and, and you're not going to be a nice person. So, how are you going to deal with that? Well, Now, if two sinners are living together, that is going to take place. That conflict is going to occur. But if there's persecution going on, there's going to be even greater struggle. Think about this. 
I mean, if you're single and, you know, you're being persecuted, I mean, all you got to think about is losing your own life. But if you're married and you have children, immediately you're going to be concerned about your spouse being persecuted, hurt, offended, violated. Your children hurt, offended, violated. I mean, you're obviously going to think about that. And that's going to bring greater care and anxiety to your heart. Notice verse 32. The beginning of verse 32 is, is really the, the, the point that he's trying to make. But I want you to be without care, or literally without concern, without anxiety. So that is the intention of his entire counsel here. Saying, I'm saying this is good, this is a better way to go, because I want you to be able to, uh, to be without care, without concern. Now, if you, if you think that marriage is the answer to all your problems, you will be sadly uh, awakened one morning to realize that you have just added problems to your life. Yes, marriage solves certain problems, but it adds other problems. And you have to take two wills and become one. You have to be able to communicate and resolve issues. And alone, you don't have to do that. You just make decisions. You seek the Lord and you choose to make the, the decisions that you are making as best you can. But when you're married, you have to be concerned about someone else. You have to care about someone else. Now, God ordained marriage as a good thing. That's pretty clear. In Proverbs 18.22, it says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So your husband, your wife is a good thing. And God intends them to be a good thing in your life. But the Scripture also says this, Proverbs 12.4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. So, he's saying there, there are two issues here you've got to con be concerned about. An excellent wife. What's an excellent wife? Well, this word excellent is a Hebrew word for virtuous wife. It's the same word used for the virtuous wife in Proverbs 31, or for how Ruth is defined in the book of Ruth. She was a virtuous woman, or a woman of strength. But this word excellent or virtuous is also used for valiant, for those that were valiant in battle. David's mighty men who were valiant. And I, I like the the connection of those two ideas because a woman of strength, a woman that's virtuous, is a woman that will be valiant in the spiritual battles that you have in life. She'll fight with you, not against you. But, he says, a contentious woman, one who causes shame, is like rottenness or decay in his bones. In other words, she will weaken him. In Proverbs 19.13, it says, A foolish son is the ruin of his father, and the contentions of a wife are like a continual dripping. They just bug you to death. And so, when, when you have contentions in your relationship, I don't care whether it's a contentious wife or a contentious husband, we can turn this passage around and that could mean you guys as well. So it is an issue that you have to consider. God ordained marriage as a good thing, but it is not always a good thing. There is trouble in the flesh if, and if a person doesn't address their fleshly relationship, their fleshly lifestyle, their selfishness, 
their pride, their unwillingness to compromise, then there's going to be problems. It's not going to be an enjoyable experience. So thirdly, he wants to consider how that you, he wants you to consider how your relationship will affect your service to the Lord. Notice verses 32 through 35. He says, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. I say this, I, I, and this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper, and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Now there is, that last little phrase is really key. It's critical. His entire purpose of making this statement is he goes, I don't want you to have undue anxiety because I want you serving the Lord without distraction. So, is marriage and can marriage cause distractions in your service to the Lord? Absolutely. They surely can much more so than if you are single. So a single individual doesn't have to worry about all of these other issues that come along with marriage and with children. And so he's saying, look, I want you to be without distraction. Now, can a person be married and live and serve the Lord without distraction? Absolutely. As long as as they are not having trouble in the flesh. You see? And as long as there is not persecution going on, because that's going to naturally bring some trouble your way. Naturally. And so, both spiritually and practically, you have to deal with the fleshly, your fleshly nature, which will enable you to keep these issues in the correct priority. His point is that time is short. He's saying you don't have a lot of time in this life and you don't know how long your life will be. He's saying I want you serving the Lord and not getting caught distracted by anything. Now go back here to verse 30. Or excuse me, the end of verse 29. He says, those who have wives should be as though they had none. So what is his point there? Well, he, he explains it in verses 30 and 31, where he says, those who weep as though they did not weep. So he's saying, don't let weeping distract you from serving the Lord. Don't, don't let the sorrows of life distract you from what I've called you to do. Don't let rejoicing distract you. Don't let buying or possessing things. Don't let anything in this world distract you from what I've called you to do. Now, only somebody who has their fleshly nature under control is going to be able to do that. Only a man or woman that is led and governed by the Spirit. That's the only way that's going to take place. Now, I have had the occasion to counsel a whole lot of couples in my ministry. And I'm telling you, when you've got one person in a marriage that is caught up in possessing things, toys, possessions, houses, money, I don't care what it is. That other person, if they do not have that same mindset, it is going to be a struggle. It is going to be a battle. And so you have to think long and hard about these issues. Keep your priorities as they were before you got married. That's what he wants you to do. Keep your priorities, the Lord first, and all the other things second. 
Don't let these things distract you. Now, the fourth principle here is in verses 36 through 40, where he talks about parental oversight and uh, making wise decisions based on your, again, your circumstances. Notice, he says there in verse 36, he says, But if any man thinks that he is behaving improperly towards his virgin, if she is past the flower of her youth, and thus it must be, let, them, let him do what he wishes. Notice again the freedom. He does not sin. Let them marry. Nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will, and has so determined in his heart, notice it's his own decision that he's made, that he will keep his virgin, does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married. Again, notice the freedom here. To whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. So, here in this particular text, there is a little difficulty because between the versions of the scripture, the New American Standard versus the New uh, International Version versus the New King James Version. And the problem arises from this word here in verse 36, any man. Now, if any man thinks he behaves improperly towards his virgin. Many struggle with this and they say, and as we see in the translations, they, some believe that this refers to the father of a virgin daughter. Others believe that this refers to a bridegroom of a virgin that he is about to marry. And so there is a, you read it, you read it one way, another person reads it another way. I, what I would encourage you to do is just consider the insight that is given here in this particular text. Notice, there are two different Greek words here that I want you to note. Uh, it says in the end of verse 36, let them marry. This is a word that refers only to someone who marries another. But then, down in verse 38, he says, then he who gives her in marriage. This is another Greek word and is usually used in reference to a father giving her uh, his daughter, in marriage, giving her over into the hand of another man, which clearly indicates the parental oversight over his daughter and over her decision-making in the issue of marriage. Now, let's just talk about that one for a minute. I think that it's very important that a person consider the counsel of their own father and mother on the person that they choose to marry. I think that is a very important thing. And I believe that it is clearly indicated here in this particular text that there must be wisdom given and received by that individual daughter or by someone in that individual woman's life to help her in making that decision. Yes, she has freedom to make the decision whichever way she chooses. So does the bridegroom. Uh, he has freedom to make his own decision. But notice he says here, if he believes that he is behaving improperly. Now what does he refer to? What does that mean? Well, it could mean anything. He does not define what he is describing here. Most likely, this is specifically be, uh, from one of the questions that came to Paul, which obviously we do not have. But the, this question of behaving improperly, was that because there was a moral Im improper relationship between these two people? 
They were burning in lust with each other, as he refers to earlier in the chapter. He says if somebody burns with lust, then they should marry. Very possibly, because it's in the context. Is he referring here to just postponing marriage? Is he behaving improperly by just by a father postponing that or a uh, bridegroom postponing the marriage? And honestly, uh, well, I've counseled many situations like that where somebody dates somebody f- and courts them for you know, five plus years and they will never commit to marrying them. And then all of a sudden they decide, well, I don't know whether I really want to marry you or not. And they've taken this poor girl, or vice versa. I've seen women do this to men as well. They take the poor guy down that road for years of relationship and never are willing to commit. And I believe that's behaving improperly. And so, because you're, you're basically toying with someone's emotions. And that is unloving and uncaring. And so it is important that if anyone feels that they are doing something that's improper, then they should try and rectify that. So take that from this council. Don't get caught up in the the question, is this the, the father or the bridegroom? I believe that it is something that you have to, they have to make a personal decision. If a person chooses, I don't want to get married, then... That's fine. They have not sinned. Just make sure you tell the other person, I am not intending to marry you or anyone. And so if you, if you understand that, then you're walking into a relationship with your eyes open. What are your intentions? That is really a good question to ask right up front. And where is this relationship going? And so I encourage people as the relationship proceeds, after a few months, you need to ask that question. What are your intentions here? Where is this relationship going? Oh, hey, we're just having fun, man. Oh, this is just a great time. We're just having a great time. That's it. Well, I don't think that that's a proper attitude to have. And so I would warn a woman or a man uh, if somebody responded in that way. So, it is important to understand that, notice, the bridegroom has a right to make his own personal decision here. The woman has the right to make her own personal decision. I really like this uh, phrase here at the end of verse 39. She, she, uh, She is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes. So, I don't believe that the Scripture teaches in the New Testament or in the Old Testament that a father arranged a marriage for her daughter and said, you're marrying this man whether you like it or not. Let me show you an Old Testament passage where that's very clear as well. In Numbers 36, verse 6, there is an instruction that was given uh, to these uh, daughters of this particular man And these daughters were told that they were at liberty to marry whomever they wished. This was when a father died and had no sons. The inheritance would pass to the daughters, which showed God did not consider women second-class citizens in the Old Testament. The father dies, no sons. The inheritance passes equally to the daughters. But then those daughters had to marry only within the tribe of, uh, that, they, that they grew up in so that the inheritance would stay within the tribe. So it says there, uh, this is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, let them marry whom they think best, but they may marry only within the family of their father's tribe. So, These women had the right to make their personal decision to marry whom they thought best. Very important principle. 
Now, the fifth principle is in verse 39 here, are you willing to marry for life? Notice that the marriage covenant is in force as long as a husband or wife lives. It says it very clear there. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if he dies, then obviously she is free, she is at liberty to marry whom she wishes. Also, uh, she is at liberty to marry whom she wishes if one of the exceptions that he has already referred to earlier in this chapter is in force. If someone has committed adultery, if someone has abandoned them and divorced them, they are at liberty to be married to whom they wish. Now, do you see marriage as something that you do for life? You see, that is a really important question. It's, it's a question, it's the first premarital counseling session I have with a couple, that's what I ask them. Are you willing to do this and stay married for life? Do you see it that way? If you don't see it that way, I'm not marrying you. I, I don't want to be a part of that because that's the biblical model. That is the biblical command. And with people who are married, who are thinking or threatening divorce, I tell them the same. Don't go there. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. If you have, ask forgiveness for threatening or even thinking about how can I get out of this relationship because that is not a biblical plan. In Matthew 19.6, Jesus said there, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. That's pretty clear. That's a command of Christ. Let not man separate. The sixth principle here is in verse 39 as well. Is this person a Christian? Now, this is probably the most important question to answer. Is this person a Christian? That's first. First and foremost. Notice it says she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. So, you can marry anybody you choose. Just make sure they're a Christian. That's, that's an absolute. Why is that so important? Because if you marry somebody who is a non-Christian, you are saddling yourself with someone that is going to be a thorn in your side for the rest of your life. And God does not intend that. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, it says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Now, what does it mean to be unequally yoked together? Yoking, of course, obviously gives you the picture of a set of oxen. You don't yoke an oxen with a mule. You yoke two oxen together. Otherwise, they would be unequally yoked. Now, you might think your husband or wife is a mule, but they, they aren't in reality if they are a professing Christian. But I encourage you, think about this, because to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever is something that you don't want to do. It is, it's violating a direct command of the Lord. I will not marry a Christian and a non-Christian. I will not do it. It is very clear in Scripture. So, the term here, unequally yoked, it is a yoking together in any kind of binding relationship, legally or maritally. And this was one of the problems the Corinthians had. They did not consider the people that they were yoking themselves with. Now, what kind of a Christian are they? That's the next question. You see, are they a Christian, but are they a committed Christian? That's, that's another very important question. Why? Because if they're not committed, then they will most likely leaven, be like leaven in your life. 
and they will be like rottenness in your bones because they are not a person of virtue, of strength, or of honor. In 1 Kings 11.4, it says, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Now I read that to you because if you read that in its context, the verses just prior to that, it says Solomon married wives that were not believers in the Lord. And what happened? They turned his heart after other gods. So that is why the Lord does not want you marrying a non-Christian or an uncommitted or superficial Christian. Why? Because Every marital problem is first a spiritual problem. So when people have marital troubles, I know that is the first issue I need to address in counseling with them, is where are you at spiritually? Because that's the problem. That's where all the problems begin. And that's where they will be solved as well. So the seventh and last one uh, issue is not in our text here, but is implied by all that I've just said to you. If you're going to marry a Christian and a committed Christian, the, the next and last question is, are you a committed Christian? You see, if you want to marry somebody like that, the most important question is, are you that person? That's, that's the question you've got to answer first. That's why getting married to someone when you're a brand new Christian is really not a very wise thing to do. You need to grow in the Lord a little. You need to learn what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Him. And that will enable you to have a good marital relationship with that individual that you're marrying. You see, marriage is a work of God. It's a work of God that He does first inside of you, and that he does between you and another person. It's his work. Go back to that passage in Matthew 19, 6. It says, They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together. What God has joined together. You see, it's God who joins two people together. He is the only one who makes two people one. It takes his working. His Spirit, His working inside of them. And only those who allow Him to work inside of them will see their marriage work the way it is supposed to. In Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. So, are you allowing the Lord to work inside of you? And if you do, and you are that committed Christian, then that is the best chance you have of making a wise decision in who you marry. Because you're going to see the same issues in their life. You're going to see, because you're going to know it. Because you know those issues, those principles, the commitment in your own life. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we do just pray that your Holy Spirit would, Lord, enable us to take this wise counsel and, Lord, share it with those that are single that, that we love and care about. Lord, I pray that every single person here tonight would take these principles to heart and make a wise choice with that second most important decision that they make in their life, and that is who they marry. And Lord, I pray that you would make each one of us here, married or single, Lord, make us men and women who serve you without distraction. Lord, keep our hearts fixed upon you. Keep our hearts, Lord, in that place where we can serve you whole heartedly with everything we have. Lord, we know that that's where the greatest 
satisfaction in life is found is serving you, following you, knowing you. And so, Lord, come and fill us with your Spirit. Bring that to pass, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.